This year has led to the beginnings of a reckoning for the manufacturers, marketers, and distributors of opioids. The epidemic has taken hundreds of thousands of American lives over the past two decades. Multi-billion dollar settlements have been announced. But there is great anger. Many states say there is not enough accountability and transparency over the company's roles. Purdue Pharma, which created OxyContin and is controlled by the Sackler family, is the biggest target. As Amna Navaz tells us, there's new information about how the company responded in the earliest days. Judy, the information comes from newly unsealed court documents that include Richard Sackler's emails in the late 90s. Sackler was a senior vice president of the company at the time, one year after OxyContin was launched. By 1999, he was president of Purdue Pharma. The documents were part of a court case against Purdue Pharma in Kentucky, and as part of that case, Richard Sackler was deposed in 2015. STAT News has been working to get these documents for four years, and Casey Ross of STAT joins me now. Casey Ross, welcome to the News Hour. Help us by understanding what is the new information you've learned from these court documents when it comes to Purdue Pharma, the Sackler family that owns it, and OxyContin. Well, these documents really shed light on the interactions that the Sackler family, in particular Dr. Richard Sackler, had. Uh, with executives at the company during the key time period in which OxyContin was being released into the marketplace. And what is that connection based on what you've seen so far? The emails that we found uh, in, in these court records uh, discuss uh, Richard Sackler becoming aware at a very early point in OxyContin's uh, release of concerns that a large pharmacy benefit manager was expressing to doctors about abuse potential in the drug. And Dr. Dr. Sackler responded to that uh, concern by calling for a presentation, uh, specifically in which uh, he suggested that the presentation could be given to show that controlled release opioids like OxyContin were less subject to abuse potential addiction concerns uh, and diversion than other opioids. And at the time, there was no, uh, and, and since, there's no evidence to support that. How would you characterize the response to some of those concerns at the time? And also, why was it important at this particular point in history? Well, so this is a time period when OxyContin is just being released into the market. Executives at the company, uh, based on the concerns, were were very worried that they were going to get essentially blocked out of the market because Merck Medco, uh, which is the pharmacy benefit manager that raised these concerns, uh, controlled a large part of the access to the marketplace. So if Merck Medco is refusing to cover these drugs out of abuse concerns, then um, then uh, Purdue Pharma um, is in a situation where it, it cannot distribute its product, product to the extent that it wants. It cannot tap a very lucrative market for chronic pain patients. Casey, you mentioned some of the concerns raised by Merck Medco. They said that addiction could be one of their potential concerns. I want to read you an excerpt from one of the emails you published. It's from Richard Sackler. He says, we should consider that, quote, addiction may be a convenient way to just say no, and when this objection is obliterated, they will fall back on the question of cost, unless we can give a convincing presentation that CR, that is controlled release products, are less prone to addiction potential. Based on these emails that you've seen, Casey, Is this unusual for a pharmaceutical executive to basically be pushing to get his product out there and tamp down on concerns? I think that uh, it's not unusual for pharmaceutical executives when they're launching a product to try to protect its reputation and push it into the marketplace in a way that's going to be beneficial to the company. I think here the situation is that OxyContin is an opioid. It's a drug which contains a lot of inherent addiction potential. So it's something that's uh, sensitive. And I think that these documents really shed light on the extent to which, despite those potential uh, concerns about addiction, uh, the company was intent on uh, aggressively marketing the product. Casey, the big question is, now what? There have been a lot of questions about what the Sackler family knew and what they didn't know. There's ongoing litigation. There's a tentative settlement. What do these new emails tell us, and do they change how things could move forward at all? 
Well, that's going to be a question for authorities across the country who are evaluating uh, how this circumstance ought to be resolved in terms of the financial liability that the Sackler family might face ultimately for the addiction problems that are ongoing in communities across the country. So uh, uh, there are attorneys general states across the country and other jurisdictions that are refusing to sign on to a settlement with the Sackler family um, right now that would resolve those concerns because they're concerned that the family is not being held accountable enough financially uh, for the harm that has been caused. So I think that's going to be a question in light of these records uh, that, uh, that folks are going to continue to focus on and, and we'll have to see what the result is. Casey, I should mention a lawyer for the Sackler family in response to your article said there was nothing improper in those emails. They say the emails discuss how doctors who prescribed OxyContin were upset that insurance companies wanted to avoid paying for their patients' medicine. They also say that Dr. Sackler was just responding uh, by asking whether it would be accurate to make a presentation to the insurance companies that they deferred to produce in-house experts. What do you make of the Sackler family's uh, response? Well, they're emphasizing uh, essentially that he uh, did defer to company experts uh, in asking the question of whether that presentation uh, could be given. And they also pointed to Dr. Dr. Sapp Sackler's 2015 deposition in which he said, look, I was just asking a question here um, as to whether a medically correct presentation could be given to show the claim um, you know, that I'd like to make. But I think it's really up to the public and authorities to consider uh, whether or not um, the presentation that he was calling for uh, had an effect on marketing OxyContin in a deceptive way, ultimately. And I'd also like to note we have offered the Sackler family or their representative a chance to join us on the program in the future. For now, that is Casey Ross of Stat News. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you.